So Ross, welcome to the Feel Better Live More podcast. <laughs> Thank you. How are you feeling, by the way? Well, I- I'm actually uh, feeling a little bit surreal at the moment. Um, let's let's just set the scene. So we are here in Bantham in Devon. The guys at Vivo have invited me down uh, for their Vivo retreat, and I've just completed a swim run. Now, for those of you listening who don't know what a swim run is, basically it's a endurance event where you basically wearing a wetsuit, you're wearing your shoes, you swim in your shoes and you run in your wetsuit. And to put it in to put it in context, guys, I have never done an endurance event. The most I've ever done is a park run on a Saturday morning with my son, which is a 5k event. I've never done open water swimming before and I've just completed my first swim run. So we're going to explore that. So that is what we're talking about. We're actually here in this Vivo Barefoot uh, wagon. That's double V A G O N, and it, it's awesome. It's like all sustainable. It's made, you know, it's made of wood. The solar panels, and it's all about health and well-being. It's about sustainability. It's about community. So, yeah, Ross, just setting the scene for the listeners. I love it, Ross. You know, for my listeners who don't know who you are, you have done some pretty superhuman feats. Um, <laughs> and, and the last one you did was you actually. What, why don't you sign it? You swam around the UK. Explain yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, they're niche sports, aren't they? They're quite niche. So, yeah, I swam uh, 1,780 miles uh, all the way around the coast of Great Britain. Uh, it took 157 days. Um, a lot of uh, skin from around my neck and my tongue from, from chafing and, and salt water exposure. <laughs> For me, that was one event that, that felt... What what we've just spoke about there, cathartic afterwards, it was done for intrinsic reasons. It was this idea of, I think, afterwards, I just love the fact that I can be, you know, an old man and I can go out to anywhere on the coast and go, oh, I've swum past there. So, you know, for me, it was the culmination of a lot of of work and, and studies in sports science as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's incredible. I, I also have heard that you've done a marathon whilst pulling a car <laughs> yeah, that's true what what, did, what's that, what, what car did yeah, you pull that was a bad idea yeah it was a, a 1.4 ton car um well th- that was yeah so we uh, i kind of finished uh, playing water polo and, and swimming for great britain so when i finished i, I kind of needed something to train for um friend of mine who's absolutely fine now he, he was di- diagnosed with cancer at the time. Uh, we wanted to do something to raise money for uh, the Teens Cancer Trust. Um, and so a friend of mine just said, why don't you run a marathon? Someone was like, oh, you know, that's been done. I was like, run two marathons. It was like, ah, again, it's been done. And then someone went, run a marathon, pull in a car. I went, that is not a bad idea. So <laughs> long story short, agreed to do it. Silverstone Race Circuit heard about it. Um, they threw me the keys to Stowe Circuit and they said, look, uh, as long as you need uh, to complete it, please, you know, have the circuit. And it took uh, 19 hours, uh, I think 19 hours, 33 minutes, something like that. But 1.4 tons uh, was pulled 26.2 miles. I mean, it was I, don't, I don't know what to say to that. It sounds absolutely incredible. But, but for those of you listening who actually feel... We know what Ross is superhuman as he is. I have been watching Ross for a while and I think we can all learn tips and principles from what you have done. And I really want to want to touch base because I don't want people to feel the same. You know what? That's all right for Ross. He's really fit. He trains hard. Yeah, he can do that. What's that got to do with me? And I, I really want to touch on a few things like mindset mm. and, and pushing yourself beyond what you consider your comfort zone to being. I feel a bit surreal at the moment because I have just completed my first endurance event. I'm not eating much after. I wasn't that hungry. And I'm sort of floating on cloud nine at the moment. In fact, maybe, you know, you could probably provide some answers for me. So given that I've just done it, let me ask you a few questions, right? So the event I did today was the Swim Run Experience event, right? So put in context, I've never swam in open water before. I do swim a couple of times a week at my local pool. Uh, maybe I'll do three, 400 meters, but normally after each 50 meters, I'll stop and just, you know, have a little breather. It was the power of the community today that persuaded me to do this. So I swam about 1.8K today in open water and I probably ran about 9K. Again, I, I only run about 5K once every two weeks or so. So well beyond my comfort zone and, and doing the events one after the other is something I've never done before. But here's the funny thing for me. I started off with a 100 meter open water swim. That was a short one. And I thought, oh, that'll be fine. I can swim 100 meters. Halfway into that, I start to panic. My partner said to me, wrong and you hyperventilate and just try and slow down, try and slow down your breathing. But I couldn't. So, you know, what was going on there? Because in that 100 meter swim, I was thinking, there is no way that once I've done the next run, I can swim the 500 meters when I'm, I'm really far away from land or the 1K. And... Weirdly enough, 
the 500 meters and the 1K was absolutely fine, but I couldn't do the 100 meters. So what was going on there? Do you know what? I, I love what you said there because basically I think a lot of the principles that I experienced on the Great British Swim, it was an extreme example, but it's absolutely applicable. So everything that you just described there, I was experiencing through the 150 days at sea. I think when you start looking at Tim Noakes uh, and his work on central governor theory, he basically proposed this idea that fatigue is an emotionally driven state that we use to, to pull the physiological handbrake. And what he meant by that was uh, when you are 60 miles into a marathon, you think, I cannot go on. You know, my lungs are on fire. My legs are burning. I cannot go on. There's no way. All of a sudden, 25 miles in, you see your family and friends and everyone's clapping. You see your kids at the finish line and you sprint, you know, all the way to 26.2 miles and you heroically cross the line because Tim Noakes proposed that this idea of fatigue being an emotionally driven state, we use it because it's basically our brain, which is incredibly manipulative, which is trying to, just because it's trying to self-preserve, it's, it's this inbuilt self-preservation mechanism that is saying, whoa, you're not safe, you're not safe, fight or flight, just saying you're not safe, wrong and you're not safe. And it was exactly the same that when you got in the water today, all of a sudden, central governor theory, your body started to go, whoa, 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 whoa. it's cold, you're hyperventilating, get out of the water, I can't Stop. see the bottom. Yeah, everything thing was screaming out and it, it is it's a primitive inbuilt self you know self-preservation so, so, mechanism so would you say an appropriate response Absolutely, but you have to understand we're still wired like our ancestors. So that exact mechanism would have protected us and we would have like ran from a saber-toothed tiger or anything. Now, we don't have a saber-toothed tiger to, to, to worry about, but instead, we're actually voluntarily putting ourselves in those positions. And even though we're voluntarily doing it, the mechanisms are still there, they're still exactly the same. So I think what, once you know this idea, Tim Noakes also like expands on it a little bit and talks about this idea of anticipatory regulation. And what he means by this is knowing now that you are far more powerful than your own mind allows you to believe. So when you said, okay, how far could you swim this morning? How far can you swim and run this morning? You would say to me, oh, Ross, you know, self-preservation mechanism. You would have gone, oh, maybe 5K. You know, and that is just your body saying, do you know what, Rongan? That will keep you safe. You're not going to go to complete exhaustion. You know, you're not going to yeah. hyperventilate. You're not going to suffer from hyperthermia. 5K, 5K anticipatory regulation. The reality is, is you're so much more powerful than even your own mind allows you to believe. And we're now only just understanding this in terms of sports psychology. So what you've experienced now is this kind of like, oh, wow, this cathartic sense of I'm safe. You know, there was that fight or flight, biochemically, all sorts of things. There was like an orchestra of things going on inside of your body. Neurotransmitters, chemical signals in the brain, everything was firing, going, whoa, whoa, what are you doing, what are you doing? And now you've come out the other end and you've gone, Wow, you know, I did survive that. Yeah. And it's almost like a huge reward as well. You look at like serotonin, dopamine, everything just dumped in your brain to go, you're safe now. You're safe. Go and go and have a nice pizza. Go well, and well, relax. It's funny because rationally it doesn't make sense. Just before I came here, yeah. my, my son, my family have come down for the weekend, and it was great that my son and my daughter got to witness that. And he said, Hey Daddy, which is which was the toughest swim for you? I said it was a hundred meter swim. Then he goes, but you swam 1.2k at the end and, and 500 meters. And I said, honestly, darling, it was, it was the 100 meter swim. And you, you've just hit the nail on the head. Our minds put on the limiting factor to what we can achieve. And I really want people who are listening to this who think, well, I, I don't really want to do a swim run event or I don't want to swim around the UK. Well, what would you say to them? Yeah, that you're right. It's all completely relative. And I love what you said there, that the next frontier of human performance is in the mind. Previously, we looked at the human body, we looked at our physiology, and we looked at it in terms of almost like a simple mechanical approach. We'd look at lactic threshold, VO2, lung capacity. We'd start looking at that. The best example I can always think of is Roger Bannister. At the time, people said with Roger Bannister, you cannot run under a four-minute mile. Um, simply cannot be done. Leading physicians at the time were saying, um, you know, physiological malfunctions, your heart will explode. Like, it can not be done. Roger Bannister was also a medical student him, his, himself, um, but still laced up his trainers and, you know, Oxford ran the first sub four minute mile. Once he did, the number of people running a sub four minute mile the year after was incredible. It wasn't because there was an advancement in nutrition, technology, nothing changed. It was just because collectively we'd recalibrated the human mind to know what we were now capable of. I think we're seeing it right now with Kipchoge as well. Yeah, like, now, I was about to mention that for sure. Exactly. You're like, there was no way that we thought you could run under a sub two hour marathon no way and then all of a sudden runs 201 berlin he's just run like 202 203 whichever he was in, in london and now all of a sudden everyone's like wow this is possible but looking back through sports performance and and, and, and the history of sport you look at even um, emil zatopek 
for those who don't know, Emil Zatopek, uh, greatest endurance runner to ever exist. Um, three gold medals in one Olympics, Helsinki Olympics. Had never run a marathon before in his life, but on the morning of the marathon, decided to run it and add a third gold medal to his tally. Reason he did that, with Emil Zatopek, he had this, and I find him fascinating because he had a, a military background, but he fused the military mindset with uh, sports science. He used to run 100, 400 meter sprints with 30 seconds rest in between. Yeah, wow. it's always like let that sink in there a little that, bit. That's interval training to a max, like like hyper interval training. Yeah, and before a meal, people said we didn't know the human body could train that hard. You know, th this idea of work capacity, so your body's ability to perform and positively tolerate training of a given intensity and duration. And with a meal, Zatopek, he knew that he could take his body to that sort of a level. And when he did those 100, 400 meter sprints with 30 seconds rest in between, he does talk about that he was drilling lactic threshold, running biomechanics to so his technique and everything. But he also talks about one of the biggest benefits of those sessions was recalibrating his mind and his perception to pain. So when he did go and run a marathon, never run one before in his life, Helsinki Olympics, and still won gold, it's because he knew he could take his body to that limit. So I think to answer your question, if you voluntarily subject yourself to something, anticipatory regulation, central governor theory, and you're able to achieve beyond what you thought that you were capable of, you're able to just recalibrate your mind, its implications for everything throughout the rest of the, your, your year, you know, work life, family life, everything, it all changes. Now with yourself, previously, before today, you wouldn't have thought you could do that. Now knowing that you can, now knowing that your body is far more durable than you thought it was this morning, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change how you look at things. It, it already has. I mean, it can only be two hours or something like that since I finished. And I just have this, straight, this strange inner sense of well-being, of satisfaction. I didn't do that for, you know, an, an Instagram post. I didn't do that so I could tell my buddies. I did that for myself. Yep. And I feel inside that, you know what, what else can I do? What else can I conquer? So, so for people who are listening who go, okay, that sounds great. You not only have done this training on yourself, I understand that you've also trained other people before. Yeah, yeah. So do you have some top tips on how people can train their minds? Yeah, and, and I think it's something that we so often overlook. You know, I think when we're training, we don't look at like mind training. We don't look at, you know, cognitive functioning. But I think if you look back at um, the ancient Stoics as well, like uh, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, you know, they had a philosophy that was dedicated to coping with adversity. And I think we're not comfortable being uncomfortable. Yet when you look at our ancestors, you know, we were very good in the animal kingdom. We're not the biggest, we're not the fastest, we've not got sharp teeth. But one thing that we're really, really good at as humans is just suffering, you know, and just like endurance, suffering and sweating. So I think this idea of sometimes adversity training is so often overlooked. And what I mean by that is when you go into the gym, you might think, I'm doing a dance class today. And it's like, okay, cool, what are you training? I'm training um, uh, deadlifts. Okay, strength, your body's ability to to generate force, strength. Okay, what are you training? I'm training running biomechanics. But no one co often goes into the gym and says, do you know what, today I'm training adversity training. I'm getting comfortable being uncomfortable. And what I mean by that is you don't have to go and run 100, 400 meter sprints like Emil Zatopek. It might be something like, you know, taking interval training, you know, up the hills, go fell running, or, you know, ice cold showers to sort of go down that route as well. You start looking at our ancestors. We had this ability to thermoregulate, to vasoconstrict and vasodilate our capillaries, to open up and close blood vessels. We've lost that now because we're really comfortable. We'll go and change the thermostat. We'll put the central heating on. But as humans, we used to have these kind of this powerful physiological state. And I think, again, to, even to go back to, to Vivo barefoot, this idea of actually wearing minimalist shoes, so those intrinsic muscles in your feet, ligaments, tendons, everything works like it was designed to. I think sometimes simple steps like that, just getting back and making your body work like mother nature always intended, I think is, is one of the ways, in, in any way, like I said, cold shower, minimalist food, something like that. Yeah, 100%. I mean, there's so much to talk about there. For me, and, and people who maybe heard their first early episodes on this podcast a long time ago now, uh, I shared my story with my back and I had chronic back pain for years. I'd, I'd spent so much money and time going around different specialists, different experts, and I started to get a bit of short-term relief and then it kept coming back. And then I saw a guy called uh, Gary Wards, who I think I genuinely think is one of the world's leading thinkers in movement mechanics. I sought him out, I went to train with him because I thought I'm just, I want to learn this stuff. People said, wrong, and you're six foot six and a half, you're always going to have back pain. I thought, no way. Why does that mean I need to have back pain? I knew there was a way of getting to the root cause. 
And Gary saw me and he said, Wrong, and your right foot's completely flat. I said, okay, yeah, and I'd be told to wear insoles for that. Then he goes, here's the thing, your right foot essentially, and I'm paraphrasing now for ease of uh, understanding, but he basically said that your right foot's forgotten how to work properly. If we teach it how to move properly, I think your back problems will get immeasurably better. And I did five minutes a day on foot exercises and instantaneously I got back to playing squash, got back to everything. So that tuned me in to actually, oh, my feet are important, <laughs> right? And then that led me to barefoot shoes. And actually, I tell the story, the reason, the reason I ended up with Vivo Barefoot Shoes is because at that time, this is about seven years ago, I was looking around, there was a few other makes, I could, I, because I'm a tall guy, I'm a UK size 13, wow. and none of them made a UK 13, and I found this company called Vivo Barefoot, and they made a UK 13, so I ordered a pair, started wearing them, and literally over two years, I thought, I just feel incredible, and now they're the only shoes I wear for work, for running, for gym, even for playing squash, and it's incredible, so... It's just going back to how the body mm. was designed to function. Mm. So there's a lot to talk about. But if we think about modern life, we talk about shoes. Kids are getting put in cushioned shoes from a young age. And therefore, I think are losing touch with the ground. Yep. Um, but, but then the following question is also, you know, is modern life too comfortable? I love that. I think you're right. I think we're atrophying these ancient age old mechanisms. You know, the feet are absolutely one. You've got all these, you know, biosensors in the feet providing, you know, this, this biofeedback and how we're working, how we, how, how's, you know, the gradient, are we running too fast, too slow, all of that. We're, and we're shutting that off in these big shoes. But also on top of that, even like I said, ligaments, tendons, you know, they respond to, to weight and resistance and we're not putting that through our feet anymore. So you're right. And then even like I said about the cold water, I think what you did today, I think it it was a, a balmy 14 degrees, I think. 14 degrees, yeah. <laughs> I, I had brain freeze after two minutes. Right. I felt like it had, like, as a kid, when you'd have that cold milkshake really fast. And right. I was, I was like, how am I going to do this event? Yeah. I, I just can't function at but the moment. The same, and did that coincide with your hyperventilating as well? So I, that I, gas reflex? Yeah, it must have done. I didn't know that happened. My partner told me afterwards, really. That right. I, so I didn't know it was happening. I just thought, I don't feel comfortable here at all. But yeah, it, 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 I think it must have coincided. Yeah, cold water shock. So you're absolutely right. And I think too often, again, you know, people, I've seen it time and again, like in open water swimming and people jump in and then they'll go, oh, I'm going, I, I've got hypothermia. I'm like, no, you, you've been in 10 seconds. It's not hypothermia. That is just a gas reflex. And you can do certain things, that mammalian reflex where you put your face underwater and it's something that all as mammals have and it will slow your heart rate down. Um, reduce blood pressure, start pulling um, blood away from your, your extremities and sending it to your vital organs. These are physiological adaptations and that we all have, but we're, t we're, we're just turning them off. I love what you said. Comfort does come at a cost. So when you are really warm and you've got these big comfy shoes and, you know, you're running in the gym and you can control all of the environment, it's great. But you're now no longer working like Mother Nature intended. You know, you're not, you're not subjecting your body. To, to go off on a very slight tangent here, looking at like the work of Hans Selye, so 1936, yeah. you know, coined the general adaptation syndrome, found that in a, in a lab full of rats, he gave, uh, gave these rats a lethal dose of poison, they kill over and died. Um, and then what he found by giving another load of rats, he gave them a little bit of poison, a little bit more, a little bit more, that he found that they built an intolerance to it. And these rats, these indestructible lab rats, were just eating poison, basically. He found that through strong stress and stimuli, that is the key to adaptation. And I think everybody, you know, we, we kind of forget this, that when you are in the gym and you are suffering and doing hill sprints or on a, you know, a rower and you're thinking, oh my God, I'm suffering. It's like, yes, that is stress and stimuli that we've known since 1936 is the key to adaptation. So I think you're right, you know, and, and being so in tune with your body when you start to understand, it's a good thing. It's yeah. absolutely a good thing. What you did today was voluntarily suffering and you are so much stronger as a result. Stress and stimuli, you will adapt. You know, next, you know, next month, this will look, you know, you've, you've shifted your habitual level. What you think is normal, it's shifted now. Well, you know? I, I, I was in there, I went to my room to have a shower and my, my kids were there. I said, hey kids, what, what can you learn from what daddy did today? Because I'm, you know, as, as all parents, I'm trying to do the best that I can to try and inspire my kids. I think my daughter said, Daddy, it means, you know, you can do anything you want in the world, can't you? Or, or you can put anything you put your mind to. And I thought, okay, cool. Hopefully at six, she's learning that lesson. Wow. And I said, look, what about this? There's, um, look, there's this rectangular mat. I said, do you know what a circle of comfort is? 
because no, I said, okay, okay, imagine you're on this, this rectangular mat here. That's your rectangle of comfort. And I said, so you know what? You might do park run or you go to school or you run in the garden. That, that's all what you're used to doing. But if you do something outside that and you manage to do it, then what you've just done, darling, is you've just expanded. That, that, that rectangle's just got bigger. So you've got a new circle or rectangle of comfort. Is, is that how you would look at yeah, it? Yeah, and she got that. She understood she got that. It. She totally got I it. She's love like, that. I was, just, I was trying to put it into words for us in a way. Or, or I just want, you know, maybe it's not be over the top. You know, I just want, I never got exposed to this environment. Mm. You know, we're sitting here in this beautiful setting. There's people there watching us talk. The views here are stunning. I didn't know this existed in the UK. Mm. I've got to tell you, right? Mm. My parents were Indian immigrants. They came over to the UK to try and give themselves and the family a better life. They really pushed me hard at education. I lived in a pretty urbanized environment. Every other summer, we'd go to Calcutta for six weeks, spend time with family, which was great. And I learned so much from yeah, doing that. Yeah. But I didn't get that regular exposure to nature. And now as an adult, I'm craving it. I see my kids there and I'm thinking, guys, inhale this and actually absorb it. And I want them to learn that, hey, because my kids, you know, like all kids, I sometimes think their mind really limits them. Mm. And I want them to see daddy be scared in the morning, but then go out and do it, mm. conquer it. And I, I hope that inspires them. Yeah. I, do you know what? This is, I'm going to go off on a slight tangent here. but This is what I, this podcast is all about. Okay, tangent good. away, mate. Right. I, thank you. I'm going to say, like, what you described there, this is going to sound a bit weird, but it was over 10 years ago now. Um, and this is what I wanted to ask you when you finished, but I've waited till the podcast to ask you. But I think uh, I love what you talk about intrinsic motivation. So, so doing it so the process is its own reward. You didn't do it for medals and, and glory or anything today. The, the, the process itself was, its, it was enough. That was its own reward. And I think 10 years ago now, I was fortunate enough to um, live with the Yamabushi uh, monks of Japan. Um, wow. They go on what they call an okugaki, which is a pilgrimage where you run a marathon a day in, in the mountains. It's a mountain re uh, religion, Shugendu uh, religion. We do a, 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 a marathon a day in the mountains um, and then meditate under ice cold waterfalls um, for hours. And it's this idea of, of self-discovery through self-discipline. Now, when I was doing this, I think what I found so interesting is that I, I turned to Kunyao, one of the, the chief monks, and I said to him, uh, what's the record uh, for the Okugaki? And, and he looked at me and he was like, uh, you know, I was 19. I was very young, very naive. I was an athlete as well, still competing, um, you know, swimming and playing water polo for Great Britain. And he, he just like laughed at me and he was like, no, 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 there's not a record for an Okugaki. It's like saying, what's the record for, you know, Christianity? What's the record for, you know, like, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. You know, so he laughed at me. He was just a bit like, no, 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 no. there's no competition when it comes to spirituality and certainly what I've taken with me since this idea of like sporting spirituality in many ways that I think way back when you look at an okugaki we've been doing it for hundreds of years thousands of years as humans have been voluntarily exposing ourselves to hardship in other in order to understand things about ourselves just this idea of like going and trekking a mountain a day just to re refine the senses and focus the mind, you know, make you a little bit, you know, more, um, uh, you know, impervious to pain, you know, this idea. And I think one thing that I wanted to ask you since you finished this is, do you feel in some ways that was your okugaki like today? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's really hard to describe. You know, I'm a generally fit guy. Okay. I... I don't do endurance though. I go for short, sharp bites. Mm. You know, I'll fit in a quick 10 minute workout here. I'll go for a quick, uh, if I'm writing and I, I have a writer spot, I'll go for a quick 20 minute run. Mm. I don't go beyond that, right? So I'm generally fit, but I don't do endurance. So what has been panicking me all week is um, A, the open water element. I thought I could probably with I could get through the run. I thought, you know, I do 5Ks. Yeah, it might be tough, but at least I can breathe in the air when I'm not in open water. The open water stuff worried me because I thought I'd never done this before. So I don't know what it's going to be like. And um, it's, it's, it's funny, actually. I, was, I, I couldn't sleep last night, really. I was, I, was, I was actually, I think it was excitement, but also being scared. And I did a podcast recently with someone, and they were saying that actually you can reframe your stress response by thinking about it as excitement rather than fear. Um, I actually listened to one of your podcasts, Ross. And um, I've heard you say this phrase before where you say... Um, you, you know, I think this is about the Great British Swim. I think you said I was, what well, you would say, it's about naivety, then, oh, right? Oh, naive Not, enough to start, stubborn enough to finish. Absolutely. And I love that. And I was thinking about that, thinking, do you know what? That sounds like me. Naive enough. I don't know. You know, I was on the bus down to the start. Everyone's got their paddles, their hand paddles. They've got some 
equipment they're carrying with them. And I'm, I'm literally rocking it on my goggles on a swim hat as if I'm going to my local pool I for a swim. I love that. I love that. And, and then I thought, you know what? Maybe the fact that I don't know much about it is good. So I thought when I was panicking, actually not when I was panicking, on the second swim, I remember thinking about that phrase. So I've got to thank you for getting me through. I thought naive <laughs> enough to start, stubborn enough to finish. I am stubborn. I didn't want to. Even though before I thought I was going to pull out, I thought, no, you're not going to pull out. You're going to use your mind. You can do this. Mm. Um, so I think it was. What, what's called Okigaki? Uh, Okigaki, yeah. I love that phrase. But that was for me, yeah. 100%, because I've got a fear of the ocean. Yeah. Right? I love looking at it, but I didn't grow up around it. I don't live near the ocean. Mm. You know, I, Until a few years ago, I never actually got off a, you know, I've never really probably been in the ocean. Mm. So... I know that sounds ridiculous to some people, but for me, I, that was out with my comfort zone. So I feel, I feel today was one of the most significant days of my entire life, if I'm honest. Mm. It feels that big to me. Absolutely, hundred percent. And but this is the thing. I think sometimes people see this idea of um, you know spiritual enlightenment through sport, and they're just kind of like, oh, is that some like fair? And it's like, no, like it's accessible to everybody. And I love what you just said there as well, because I think too often there's a little bit of a, a stigma attached, or maybe a barrier to entry that you think, oh, I couldn't do that. You know, or do you need do you need the right kit? Do I need to have trained for that? No, 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 no. All you need is to be naive enough to start, stubborn enough to finish. So the very fact that you rocked up and you were like, I feel like I'm going to my <laughs> local swimming baths. I'm like, yes. Yes, amazing then that feels right you know and to finish it I, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways I'd love if, if people took this away from the podcast that it's it's like it's not the Great British Swim was amazing and I'm, I'm so incredibly lucky to have you know experienced it but it's the, the, the feeling that we're describing right now this idea of anticipatory regulation overcoming your central governor theory Tim Noakes you know that this is accessible to all of us you know that next weekend everybody listening could say how far do I think I can run I think I can do 5k cool then go and do 10. And I guarantee if you finish it, you'll be eating your Sunday roast dinner thinking, wow, I'm ready to attack the week. What, what about someone who's listening to this who is relatively inactive, right? Mm. So they live in a city, they, they want to get healthier, that they've started listening to this podcast for whatever reason, that they, they want some inspiration to get going. And so they think, well, there's no way I can do a swim run. You know, I barely go out. I don't go to the gym. I don't do much. Where can they start and how can they apply this in their life? Yeah. I think I love that question for two reasons. Number one is because I think too often um, we are heavily marketed, uh, you know, the gym or certain sports or, you know, they'll say, oh, this is the best way, way to, to lose weight. And it's just like, no, 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 no. You have to start looking at behavioral science. You know, only just an hour understanding adherence. So do are you actually going to adhere to this way of life? Um, again, uh, to go off on a slight tangent, International Journal of Obesity 2008, they did a huge meta study so a study of thousands of studies and they wanted to know what the best diet was for fat loss everyone was sitting there going well this is amazing they were you know on the edge of their seats thinking oh my god is it keto is it Atkins? is it south beach what is it and they said after analyzing all of these studies we have found and everyone's on the tent hooks on the edge of their seats that we have found that weight loss was highest in those most adherent and they went what and they were like yeah yeah, yeah. the diet doesn't matter sticking to it does and they were like Oh, so there was this idea that, okay, so in terms of when you are completely sedentary and you're just setting out, whether it's a diet plan or a workout plan, look at adherence. Are you actually going to enjoy this? Is this your okugaki? Are you going to be motivated for intrinsic reasons? Or are you saying, I want to do a triathlon because you get a nice medal at the end? <laughs> That's probably not the right answer. Do you know what I mean? Pick something that you intrinsically like. What's your okugaki? What are you going to be able to adhere to? I think for some people, if they're like, I used to play tennis as a kid. I've not done it in ages. Cool, then go down your local tennis club. I used to I used to swim, but I've not done it in ages. Cool, then dust off those goggles and get in. You know, I spoke to Vassos Alexander um, oh, about, legend. about, I don't know, nine months ago or something. We, we had a fantastic chat. And he told me, I think, again, I might be slightly wrong with the age, but it was about at the age of 29. He went for a jog and he couldn't get to the end of his street without feeling out of breath. And literally within about two or three years, he's doing some ultra marathon in Greece. And I thought that was inspiring to go, hey, guys, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you start. Just start somewhere mm. um, and, and just build from there. Yeah. I really want to, you know, I love intrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. Perhaps the first question is perhaps you could explain what those things are for people listening who may not be familiar with those terms. But the second question is, in this era of social media, where everything we do is documented on social media, and for many people, if it's not documented on social media, it almost doesn't exist. Mm. Are we in danger of doing things for extrinsic motivation rather than intrinsic motivation? Or 
is there even some benefit in that? Because even if that is going to stimulate you and inspire you to do something, it's better than nothing. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. So in terms of intrinsic motivation, intrinsic motivation is when you are motivated for internal reasons. So the, the process is its own reward. When people say, why are you, it could be anything. Why are you knitting? Why, why do you like going walking in like the countryside? You go, because it just feels nice. That is intrinsic. Extrinsic motivation is why do you want to go and do that triathlon? And they say, because there's prize money. <laughs> Why do you want to go and uh, run up that mountain? Oh, because I want to take a selfie at the top. I want it for my Instagram profile. Nothing wrong with that, but these are extrinsic motivating factors. And I think consciously understanding which one motivates you is is often the first key. I think, you know, subconsciously people aren't actually, you know, they're not aware of it. You know, so they are just, they're just training, they're plowing on. It's just like, well, hang on, like, what's the motivating factor here? Reason being, and there was again, a, a study done with the US military and they found that those, it was a huge study, and they found that those who were intrinsically motivated, there was a direct correlation between that and them higher achieving within the ranks of the US military compared to those for external reasons who were maybe saying, oh, it's good money, uh, you know, or I, I, I look good in a uniform. You know, there, there was those people who intrinsically motivated were saying, because I, I just want to do, so, I want to serve my country. I want to, you know, my, my great, great granddad was in the military. It was, it was those sorts of reasons. Um, do, that do, 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 we, do we know if there's a genetic predisposition to that? Or is it something we can train? Like, you know, are, are some of us more driven by that intrinsic motivation, some external? And if we are more external, do you know? I don't know if you know the, know the science on this. Can, can we train ourselves to be intrinsically motivated? That's, do you know what? That is a brilliant question. Just because they say training is the realization of one's genetic potential. And so you can see right now, lining up on the start line, okay, you know, he is genetically predisposed to strength training. He's good at endurance. Yes, we, we know that. But what we're describing, talking about now, is so many intangibles. It's like, does he have, have a genetic predisposition to be good at resilience? Does he have a genetic uh, predisposition to be intrinsically motivated? It's like, we, we don't know. But this huge gray area is where there is like complete untapped resource. You know, so, and, and I think the only thing is, is if you start looking at... I'm a huge fan of Ralph Waldo Emerson, who, you know, preached um, this idea of, you know, self-empowerment and and really like that you are your own best expert. You know, I love what you do. I love what you broadcast. But the reason that I love your podcast so much, Rongan, is because you actually empower people to make the decisions themselves. It's like if you to use a swimming analogy, you know, quite often when you're going to see an, a, a doctor, uh, you need a lifeguard. But what you're doing is actually equipping people with uh, swimming lessons. You know, before you're their swim coach in some ways, so that prevention is better than cure. Uh, well, I mean, thanks, Ross. I mean, I, as I say in the in the intro, you know, I'm trying to empower every listener to be the architect of their own health. Yeah, I don't want I don't want people to do things because you told them to or I told them to. In fact, I don't think we're telling anyone what to do. We're having a conversation. I hope. People feel inspired to, you know, I hope someone listens to this and goes, you know what, let me just examine the things that I do in my life. How many of them would I be happy doing mm. if I didn't post about them on social media? Would I still do it? You're right. And no one's, no one else can answer that. There's, there's not an expert that can tell you the answer to that other than yourself. So you're absolutely right that I think all we can do is equip people with, you know, the, the definitions of extrinsic, intrinsic motivation so they can actually understand. But you're right. And I think all of these intangibles, you don't know. You can only empower people. But, you're, but I would love it if in a month's time people take to social media and say to us, I found my Akigaki. I'm doing this for intrinsic reasons. You know, I'll be like, that's amazing. Guys, guys, that is a challenge mm -hmm. after this. I mean, you know, we've still got a long way to go, I hope, in this conversation. <laughs> but you must, that, I mean, please think about that. And do let Ross and I know on, on social media. We would love to. And we're not anti-social media. Both of us are active, mm. yeah. right? And there's nothing wrong with posting about what you're doing. Nope. We're trying to just tap into... What is your motivation? Is mm. that the only motivation or is there something else? I love what you said there, actually, because certainly on the, the swim, people said to me, you know, swimming for 157 days, 12 hours a day, you know, how did you keep yourself uh, motivated? And I think a lot of people just wanted that one line where I'd say I did it for family and friends, you know, or something like that. But the reality is you had to switch to have almost... 
you know, like a split personality in that sometimes I'd be extrinsically motivated. It went, coming into the Kyla Lockhouse, it was amazing. We, we just set the record for the world's longest stage swim. Um, the media were there. They said some very nice things about me. I would be lying to you right now if I didn't said that didn't motivate me extrinsically. Of course it did. You know, there was also, you know, coming in at the, at the end of the swim, knowing, uh, being told that I had a trident created for me. I was like, well, that's pretty cool. Was you that know? the trident I saw before? It was. Uh, no, it was. I've seen the trident. <laughs> so there was these reasons that I was like, yeah, absolutely. However, in those moments across the Moray Firth where you are 60 miles from land, you cannot see the hand in front of your face. It's that dark. You're getting like just hit in the face by jellyfish. Extrinsic motivation probably isn't enough. Exactly the same as you today. That when you were there hyperventilating everything, you know, extrinsic motivation, it probably wouldn't have been enough to no. see you all the way through. Someone couldn't have just constantly gone, oh, but you'll get a medal at the end. I'd be like, like, I don't care about the medal. I don't <laughs> care about the medal. However, if I'd have said, oh, wrong, and uh, j just to let you know, there's no medal at the end, but, but your kids are watching. I guarantee you would have sprinted. So now knowing what pushes your buttons and what intrinsically motivates you is very powerful. And you just need to do that yourself as well. And I think knowing how to, to ask yourself, push your own buttons. You know, what's motivating me today? You know, but, but to, to, to just sort of sum up on that as well, because this might be something that a lot of people um, can relate to. But I think even uh, body composition, body fat, you know, training purely for aesthetics. So in this kind of social media driven uh, you know, world that we now live in, there's a lot of people who will, um, you know, to train just for that selfie on the beach and there's nothing wrong with that but you've got to acknowledge that's purely extrinsic so once that picture has been taken what's left are you still motivated yeah. if you have things that are intrinsically motivating you for, for me for instance i like to keep my body fat quite low just because um i'm quite a chunky runner and i don't want to be putting four to five times my own body weight through each foot with every successive jump and run so i try and keep lean for that reason but the, the reason I also do that as well is because I want to enjoy running. I like the intrinsic feeling of running and I wouldn't enjoy that as much if I was holding a lot of weight. So right. my body composition is a byproduct of being intrinsically motivated to enjoy running, you know, but also I won't lie. It was quite nice, again, to be so honest and open, to be asked to do the cover of Men's Health. That was extrinsic, but I had both. Yeah, you had both. And again, I, I love the way you put that, Ross. It's not about saying... You know, we're, we're all saints and we don't like putting up a good mm. shot on Instagram, right? Mm. We're not. We, 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 we're humans. Mm. We've all got an ego to some degree, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Uh, unless you're a Buddhist monk, in which you <laughs> might have just about sorted out your ego. But do you know what I mean? It's, it's not, I don't think we're here to say, don't do that. That's fine. But just figure out what it is. Yeah. Um, let's, let's really dive deep into the swim you did because... You know, as someone who hadn't been in open water before today to swim, I just find that insane that you swam around the UK. So what does that look like in real life? Okay, you you, you want to swim around this island. Yeah. What are you wearing? <laughs> Where are you sleeping? What are you eating? What happens when you're knackered and you're in the middle of the water? I mean, tell me about it. What, what you know, what, yeah. what yeah. Teach me, what happens? Yeah, do you know what? I'm glad you asked that. Just holistically to talk about it, really. Only because um, I, I, I'm honestly not self-deprecating when I say I, I, it wasn't a swim. I just got really good at floating and eating. You know, so really it was just about you know, 10,000, 15,000 calories, you know, per day, you know, trying to manage wounds and chafing, um, trying to manage your immune system you know, when swimming through, you know, shipping lanes. We were all like, looking at, you know, gut bacteria, everything. We really tried to drill down. But how, into how do you manage it? You say you want to manage your immune system. How? And this is what got weird that I think for everything, and you'll understand this, you know, far better than myself and, and most other people, but for everything that we were trying to treat, um, we didn't know. So when we were looking at gut bacteria or when we were speaking to uh, medical professionals, they were saying, oh, we, I mean, we, we can treat you if we know what you're digesting and what's in those shipping lanes and polluted water, but we don't know what we're treating. So we can't really look to preempt that. What was it pretty gross at times? Oh, like, yeah, right. I mean, like, yeah, was, <laughs> yeah, no, it got like, but I, do you know what? And again, this comes back to something that's slightly weird. So I do a lot of work with uh, Wim Hof. Um, so Wim Hof. I love those, his stuff. Oh, God. Again, you know, it reminds me very much of yourself, though. He's just trying to empower people with the tools 
tools that they need. But so Wim Hof, for those who don't know, um, you know, turned around uh, to, to modern medicine and said, I can control my immune yeah, system. And, incredible. and they were like, no, you know, you can't. It's your autoimmune system. You, you don't have control. And he said, no, 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 I can. Um, and then there was a study, you know, widely publicized, basically injected him with quite a violent virus and, and, and several other test subjects. Uh, all of them signs of vomiting, diarrhea. Wim, absolutely fine. And not only that, now he's shown that you can pass that on and he can teach other people yeah. to control their immune system. So I did a lot of work with Wim before I left. And I think one thing that was probably overlooked, and again, now objectively, we understand cold therapy, you know, cold water therapy has been shown to actually increase you know, white T cells. It's been shown objectively to a small but significant amount. So I think one thing that was really weird is throughout the 157 days is I wasn't ill. I didn't take a single day off sick. But that makes no sense when you start looking at it in terms of you know, conventional wisdom that they're like, hang on, you're, you're swimming through shipping lanes. And you're sewage. Swimming, and sewage, oh yeah, like toxins from the jellyfish. That makes no sense, but it's like, mm, is it? Or could you argue that I was at sea doing cold water therapy you know, for hours a day, tapping into this powerful primitive state where over 157 days, I became like Han Selye's indestructible lab rats. And it was this complete yeah, I mean, exp sea experiment that I never intended. But looking back now, I was like, yeah, that is a bit weird that I wasn't ill. Yeah, you're right. I mean, on, you, you, so many lovers, it's mad that you weren't mm. ill. You weren't taking prophylactic antibiotics or anything. Nothing. Yeah, it's exactly it. Even looking at pacing strategies as well. So we know, you know, anecdotally and objectively, everyone that experienced this, if you go and do a, a huge week's training and you're there like swimming in lactic acid, you need a recovery day, your, your muscles are sore, you've got DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness, and your body's just in pieces, your central nervous system is going, what are you doing? Adrenal fatigue, everything. That is fine, that, but that will directly impact on your immune system. Whereas with me, it was trying to manage that throughout the entire swim. So whenever I could just maintain that aerobic state where I'm not breathing heavy and I can supply enough oxygen to the body to maintain this aerobic state, I knew that if I could maintain that, that prevention was better than cure. I love what you just said there because it's like, absolutely, when I'm starting to take medication, it might be too late. I need to actually prevent myself getting ill to that point. So, so you were doing cold water therapy by default rather yeah. than thinking about oh I'm yeah. going to have one minute at the end of my hot shower yeah. to go cold right which again that might be a strategy you recommend but um, Wim Hof right I, I'm super fascinated I actually saw Wim speak in LA last year maybe a year and a half ago and he said at the start I was there's about two or three hundred people we were sitting there watching him and I knew I'd seen his podcast I'd seen all the stuff I love it and he said within uh, within the next I don't know, 15 minutes, you're all going to be holding your breath for three minutes. Mm. I was like, no way. No way. Everyone in here is going to be holding their breath. Anyway, we went through the method. And then after one round of his breathing, I held my breath for, I think, a minute or a minute and a half. I thought that was pretty easy. And then two minutes and then three minutes. And I was like, I've just held my breath for three minutes. If someone had told me that 20 minutes ago, I'd be like, no way can I hold my breath for three minutes. So Vim's got a technique, which is brilliant. And... I am speaking to him at some point in the next couple of months on the podcast. We just need to fix up the date, um, which I can't wait to do. But so you have done some training with him. You have practiced his breathing methods. Yeah. So what I'm interested in, when you're out there, you're swimming for 150 plus days, 157? Yeah, 157, yeah. Right, so you're swimming for 157 days. Are you practicing that breathing method in the morning on your boat before you go in the water? Or have the training you had done prior to going... You know, I, I'm interested. Is it something you have to do a daily practice? I, I think for the swim, certainly, it was just, I love what you said there. Inadvertently, I was just doing cold water therapy. And I think for me, you know, that was all I was, there, there wasn't, when you're swimming for 12 hours a day, you're sleeping, eating, and doing tidal charts and everything for the rest of the time. So there wasn't a lot of time to do, you know, prehab, rehab, everything like that. Um, so for me, I think it was inadvertently doing it. And, and that's what I love about um, Wim, that, that sometimes he's saying, let's remove all this, you know, stigma. Uh, with this breathing exercises, you know, I love that some people are there going, okay, do I breathe uh, in through the nose, out through the mouth? And he, he just will go, you know, just use whatever hole you can use. Yeah, and then I you're know. Like, <laughs> In his inimitable way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I love that, that I think it's the, the same that on the swim, I'm like, not through any purposeful or intelligent approach do I claim that I wasn't sick. I think it was now only retrospectively, I'm kind of going, 
Maybe it was the fact that I was doing, um, you know, cold water therapy. Maybe it was the fact that I was trying to maintain a permanently aerobic state where I never really tapped into that lactic threshold where I took my body just beyond, you know, that point. Um, you know, maybe it was because I was coming like Han Selya's indestructible lab rats through stress and stimuli. You know, I was basically becoming this kind of, you know, like, yeah, indestructible lab rat. Um, that, that only now I think I wish I'd have known before the process but i'm trying to deconstruct and reverse engineer it basically no yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> love it i mean there's yeah it's just incredible uh, and uh, to think that vim does his you know his method is breathing and i think another point shot onto my head there which is these days we have this perception that you know wellness or well-being is to preserve of the wealthy or the or the middle classes but let me tell you breathing is free right? Mm -hmm. You can watch a video on YouTube and watch what Wim Hof teaches and you can practice it yourself, yeah. right? And it's free of charge. That is applicable to every single person listening to this yeah. right now. Yeah, I think you're right, actually. And, and on that note, I mean, one thing that I didn't have the luxury of, because um, obviously the tide changes every six hours. So it was six hours on, six hours off, six hours on, six hours off. So for me, it wasn't um, just sleep deprivation, but sleep disturbance. I never got that deep, you know, sort of growth hormone rejuvenating, you know, neurotransmitter yeah. replenishing sleep, you know, that really deep stuff. I never really got that. Did you bro. track that? No, again, no, yeah. this is purely sort of subjective, you know, but I knew that time after time the physio was coming on the boat. I could feel like upper respiratory tract infection. I was like, oh, no, I'm getting ill. You know, my, my tendons and joints were just like contorted. And my physio was just, you know, Jeff was amazing, was just saying, you, you just need sleep. You, that's all you need. It's free. You know, and he was saying exactly the same. And I think certainly looking at a lot of studies, um, I, I sometimes argue that because sleep can't be monetized, breathing can't be monetized, yeah. you know, very well, that there's not as many studies on it. Um, whereas in reality, I love that, you know, yourself and a lot of, you know, medical professionals now will just say, let's do the basics. Almost, Get the basics right. Oh, almost like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, you look at the very bottom, that physiological needs, you know, sleep, warmth, you know, food. It's like, do that right. And again, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's, it's slightly, again, for those, um, you know, listening, you don't know, Maslow basically dictated this uh, uh, pyramid pyramid had a hierarchy of needs that said dictates human behavior and you know at the very bottom there is just this idea of you know warmth sleep and food as you move up you start looking at family and friends as you move up self-worth and as you move all the way up philanthropy at the very top but at the bottom at the very very basic you've just got these physiological needs and I think for me Certainly during the swim, there was a lot of people who were saying, oh, this is amazing, Ross. Can you talk about your motivation? And I'll say, absolutely. And sometimes I'll talk about central governor theory, Tim Noakes, and I'll be, and they'll go, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there'll be times, you, for instance, today, where you are all of a sudden, you jump in, you're hyperventilating, feels like your chest is closing up. I can't have a conversation with you. I'm going, Roman, oh, let me tell you about the central governor theory. You'll be like, no, 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 no. Yeah. I am Too so, late, then. yeah, exactly. You're like, I am so <laughs> primitive right now. My body's going warmth, you know, and oxygen. That's what I need. And I think it's the same, like seeing you run past here, you know, when I was like, oh, how are you doing? Again, you might have been thinking, I'm getting carb depleted. So right now, blood sugar levels, are, I'm looking for carbs. You know, yeah. I'm looking for sugars, you know, and I think, again, sometimes just taking everything back and stripping it back to its most powerful and primitive form is the best what we can do. And that's exactly what you did today. You were just like, OK, literally me, the ocean and a bunch of mountains. Let's find out. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's funny. Have we ever, had we had this conversation this morning? Right. And I'd learned all that with my rational brain and mm. I'd absorbed it. Mm. I don't think the outcome would have been any different, right? No. I still think first time in the cold water, first time in when you can't see the bottom, yep, yep, yep. I just think that's just an inbuilt primitive <laughs> reflex that would just kick in. So yeah. your rational brain is like, that's all, it's all very well to talk about it. Yeah. You've got to just go through it. You've yeah. got to experience it and come out the other side. Mm. Um, I, You're so, right. But I love what you said there, just because I think, again, for anyone listening, is these takeaways, when you are on your okugaki, you know, and that you think, oh, yeah, oh, wrong and Ross, what are they talking about? Oh, okugaki, I'm going to go and run up, um, you know, do that fell race. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's cold and you're hyperventilating. And you wanted to do like, you go, I'm going to go open water swimming, actually. Yeah. And you get in. Understand that. Everything that they're, when they jump in and they get that gasp reflex and they, it's just like, we're all human. I would do the same. I still do it now. You know, yeah. so I think that when you do embark on that intrinsically motivated okugaki of yours, 
please understand that there's nothing you know special about me and and the great british swim and there's nothing you know it is just the application of certain principles that we've discussed and so when you do think oh you know maybe maybe when ross swam around great britain he didn't gasp and you know hyperventilate no 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 i did you know 100% wow. yeah when people go oh maybe ross is impervious to jellyfish things no 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 i like it still made my eyes water i felt really bad for myself and you lost part of your tongue is that right <laughs> you're right yeah i mean which part? Show me, show me. It's growing back now. Like, yeah. Which bit went off? Just like the top layer. I could, I wow. could peel, peel it off, basically. It was just... And yeah, again, so when people, I think, sometimes have this romantic ideal of swimming around Great Britain and emerging from the water with my beard glistening, and it, it was like, no. With your I, trident. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was like, no, no, no. I, I hadn't showered in 157 days. Like, my beard had jellyfish tentacles in it. And so, so I think that's been nice. But, but but I guess what it shows, Ross, is what we were talking about at the start, which is what is your circle of comfort, right? Mm. You went your circle of comfort when it comes to fitness is clearly a much bigger circle than mine. You're a very fit guy. You've written a book, what world's fittest? Oh, the world's fittest, yeah. yeah, yeah, which is great. <laughs> um, and I want to talk about you about your new book that you're writing, which I've seen on Instagram that you're writing at the moment. But the, the point is, isn't it, that you had your circle of comfort. Mm. And for you, the Great British Swim was outside that. So you had to still go through the same stress adaptation. Absolutely. That maybe, you know, someone sitting at home who doesn't do much might get from when they're literally going to do a 30 minute walk around the block when they haven't been up, you know, or, or, or a, a 1K run. You know, it could still be a similar type thing. It just depends where you're currently at. Just expand it a little bit. Yeah. Absolutely. Or a lot as you did. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah no, wrong. you're right. That it's this, uh, like, we humans, we like our habitual level, homeostasis. We like that. And it's just, it's, it's all relative. It's, it's completely the same. But equally, um, I think looking at, uh, to use, you know, said principles, specific adaptation to impose demands in sport, it just means you get really, really good at what you repeatedly practice. So I think that's even another thing that fitness is this really malleable, fluid term. You know, there are components of fitness when you look at strength, speed, agility, cardio, respiratory endurance you know these have specific definitions but fitness doesn't you know fitness is just it can be whatever you want it to be but you have um you've got an interesting theory i think that i've read about basic levels of conditioning for people uh, maybe you could expand on it but it's it really resonates with me because looking at you you are ripped you're stocky you're muscular you don't look like the typical endurance athlete who might be you know I'm not saying you're not lean, but maybe thinner and, oh, and yeah. leaner in a different, you know, you don't have that conventional look of an endurance athlete, mm. yet you've just done a phenomenal endurance event. So what, what's going on there? Why are you able to break the rules? Yeah, do you know what? And, and, and I'm glad you asked. I mean, there's, there's two things going on, I suppose. One is this idea of um, work capacity. So your body's ability to perform and positively tolerate training of a given intensity or duration. And I think like everybody, again, kind of imagining anyone listening here, imagine we were in uh, the old Soviet Union era and we had like, we were handed at like 100 kids and uh, I look at, you know, young, you know, wrong and I'm looking and I'm going, okay, I don't know if he's going to be tall. I mean, you're six foot six you're, six and a half yeah you're, you're a large Support. man yeah i but you know at six years old when i'm handed you and i'm your coach i don't know if you're going to be tall i don't know if you're going to be strong good at endurance we don't know so what we do is we equip you with this idea of just general physical preparedness where we teach you to run jump climb crawl building this kind of neuromuscular efficiency these like basic motor skills then at, you know 12 years old if you, all of a sudden you start like growing really tall or you get really fast we're like okay here is, he has a genetic predisposition to be good at strength, speed, stamina, whatever. Now we can start to specialize. So I think in many ways, um, my physique I built because on, on theories of, of general physical preparedness, of these sporting Soviet Union principles where I just wanted to build this, this baseline of fitness. So then later when I wanted to specialize, I could. But, and just very quickly to talk upon um, sort of strength and stamina coexisting, uh, basically you, you look at the work of Robert Hickson. Uh, Robert Hickson was a uh, biochemist, but also a molecular biologist and powerlifter. And he came up with this idea of concurrent training. He said that if you are training for strength and stamina in one session, in a single session, so if you're trying to improve your bench press, but also going to try and run a 10K uh, time on the treadmill in one session, you are diluting the potency of the stimuli. What he means by this is on a molecular level, 
You don't know what cellular signal you're sending to your body to adapt to. So again, me and you go in the gym right now, wrong, and I go, okay, cool, right, let's see what your max deadlift is. Your body will go, oh, okay, cool. On a cellular level, we are now working strength, your body's ability to generate force. And then if midway through that session, I said, okay, right, let's go for a swim. Oh, so hang on, okay, now we're looking at cardiorespiratory endurance, aerobic fitness, swimming biomechanics. Your body doesn't know what to adapt to. So it's this idea that you dilute the potency of the stimuli when you do that, so you don't really know what you're training for. However, having said that, now we're looking at these hybrid athletes who are able to fuse strength and stamina. You look at um, Strongman, as an example. You look at Brian Shaw, a former basketball player. Uh, Eddie Hall, former swimmer. Um, you look at uh, Maris Pujanowski, Karate background. So these guys, although they are the world's strongest men, they have that baseline of cardio fitness as well, which science, again, looking at uh, studies in sports science, they would argue with a baseline of, of cardiorespiratory endurance, you can basically, uh, your capillary density, so the, the, the delivery of oxygen and blood and nutrients to the working muscles, if that's improved, you're only going to be a better strength athlete. Yeah. And looking at it on the reverse, that if you're looking and you're midway through a marathon or today when all of a sudden you're exhausted, you're coming down on those descents, you know, and you're like, oh my God, I'm 10K in. All of a sudden, if you're, if you're a, an endurance athlete, but you don't have strength to hold efficient biomechanics when you're running, all of a sudden misalignment things, overuse injury, all sorts of things can start to occur. So now we're seeing how strength and stamina can coexist. And not only that, they should coexist if you want to be some of the, the best athletes in the world. Yeah, this, this reminds me that there's a book out, you'd, you'd absolutely love it, a new book by David Epstein called Range. And... Um, He's basically talking about generalization versus specialization. And the intro is brilliant because he talks about, you know, the Roger Federer versus your Tiger Woods. Mm. You know, Tiger from the age of two was drilled to become the best golfer in the world. Roger, like many other athletes, was, um, you know, they, they could have done many sports. Uh, they were doing, they had a broad base of different sports that so they specialized later. The guy who won the US Open golf last week, Gary Woodland, apparently he was a pro basketball player. And then he said, actually, I'm going to go to golf. And David Epstein's gone deep into the research and he's, and he's basically concluded that actually generalization is more important than specialization. And mm. it sort of reminds me a little bit of what you're saying, which is get that general level of um, fitness and well-being. And then later on, you know, in your 20s, if you want to do this sort of sport, yeah, you can, you can expand out and do it there. In your 30s, you want to do something else, but you've got that broad base. So, so there are some fitness professionals and some really fitness experts who listen to this. Um, who I think can apply that. But again, I always want to bring it back to people who maybe aren't fitness professionals, who aren't regular gym goers. Can they learn anything from that principle? Yeah. Oh, what, you're, you're, what can they learn? I love that because I think too often, if you are completely sedentary and you know, you've not really trained before, I think too often you are marketed, you know, these, um, you know, come to... Um, this dance class come to sprinting is good for you, cycling is good for you. It's like, well, hang on. What we're describing there is is very specialized movements. You know, what, what you can do, and, and I love this, one of my friends said, sometimes you have to train to train. And he said, what I mean by this is like, again, right now, if I was handed um, you and, and, and someone is exactly the same height, weight, age, everything, but you had a higher work capacity. So your body's ability to perform and positively tolerate training of a given intensity and duration that you build through this idea of general physical preparedness. That if they said, right, we're gonna train you to run a marathon and this other guy to run a marathon. I know if you had a higher work capacity, we could start tomorrow and do 10K straight off the bat. And all of a sudden your rate of progression, you'd po positively respond to that. And we can look to increase that incrementally, but far faster than if we had somebody else who was exactly the same height, weight, level of fitness, everything as you but they didn't have a higher work capacity as you, I know I couldn't push them as far. We'd right. have to start on a 5K. So to your point, when people are training, I would love it if people just, instead of this, uh, you know, like, sort of an end goal saying, I want to run a marathon. I'd love it if people in the gym just went, what are you training for? And they went, general physical preparedness. I am training my work capacity right now. And they went, oh, how are you doing that? And it's like doing light cardio, you know, doing like 5K runs every other, you know, week. I'm supplementing with calisthenics, so body weight work, push-ups, these really general sort of like motor skills. Yeah. Then people go, oh, that's a really kind of valid reason for you uh, rather than saying what you're training for oh i've got my uh, marathon oh i'm training for a holiday i'm trying to like reduce body fat if, if people had this really kind of 
I am just improving work capacity, my baseline fitness. Well, that, that will improve not just their fitness, that'll improve their cognition, that'll improve their focus, yeah. that'll improve every other aspect of yep. their life. Yep. If they want to read more, is that what you cover in your first book? Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and that's it. It's trying to get people to just like understand that periodization that Matt Vaev, you know, Russian scientist, long, long ago, we've understood this, but he, there was nothing wrong with this. You could say like, what are you training this year? And you could be like, I'm doing a year of general physical preparedness. And next year, I might specialize and run a marathon. But this year, general physical preparedness. Yeah. I would love that. Even as beginners, if we understood that basic concept that sometimes it's, it's fine to train to train. You know, you don't have, you don't have and, to have a goal. I think I've heard you say maybe on a previous podcast that actually you want people in a gym or, or wherever they're training to, to be able to, in one line, tell you what they're training for. Yeah. I think it's brilliant because that applies, that apply, you know, for me, someone taught me that about my own career and my mission and what is it? And they said, you've got to be able to say it in one line. I'm like, yeah, I want to do lots of things. No, no, no. You've got to be able to say it in one line. And, you know, I, it took me a lot of work, but I, I, again, it's quite simple when you come up with it. For me, it's to empower every single person I come across to understand that they can be the architects of their own health. Mm. So I've had to refine my views until I understood what am I here to do? And you're sort of saying the same thing. When you're training, know what you're training for. Yeah, I think you can go into the gym, you can stop somebody, you know, on a treadmill and say, hey, what are you doing? And they it might give you this long verbose answer. It's like, no, 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 no. Then going back to Robert Hickson's theory of concurrent training, if it's too long, if you're saying, oh, I'm training strength, but I'm going to go and do bicep curls in a minute. And I've just seen someone's just finished on the ab roller. So I'm going to go and do that. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. On a cellular level, you're diluting the potency of the stimuli. And what I mean by that is your body doesn't know what to specifically adapt to. But if you just go into the gym and you just say, what are you training for? And you go, ah, I'm just going to go on the treadmill because I'm trying to achieve a calorie deficit because I want to lose weight. Cool. Valid answer. What are you training for over there in the squat rack? I'm hitting heavy squats. I'm training strength, my body's ability to generate force. Cool, done. What are you training for over there? General physical preparedness, because next year I want to specialize. All of those are very yeah. specific answers, but it's, it's very rare that you'll get people who actually just say that. But I've never heard anyone talk about fitness in that way before. I think it's, thing, it's very novel to me. Yeah. You know, I've never heard that. I think, it's a, I think it's a beautiful way of thinking about it. Yeah. And actually to that point, if you stop somebody and you say like, if we walked around here around Bantham, you know, in Devon and we stopped somebody and said, hey, can I stop you there? Uh, I notice uh, you're going for a run. You know, what are, what are you training for? It's actually fine to maybe just say, because it's cathartic and I'm taking my dog for a walk. And it's like, okay, cool. You're not chasing a physiological adaptation what you described there is just mental, you know, meant being mentally cathartic. And that's equally as powerful. But know that that's a session for just like cognitive clarity and just yeah. like, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But even that deserves a specific line. You just mentioned mental well-being and the, 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 the fact that sometimes people train and they go running or they go out, out in nature to improve the way that they're feeling. Mm. When you are putting your body under pressure, when you're on that boat, when you're swimming, were there some days where... You know, because those are extreme conditions you're putting your body under. Did you feel down on some of those days? Yeah, I think only because you were asking so much of your body. You know, it was depleted of, you know, carbs. There was just, like I said, adrenal fatigue. There was, my immune system was kind of going like, what is this bacteria you've just ingested? You know, there was so much from it. So I think what was interesting is, is you, you know, we now understand our bodies are these complex biochemical organisms that there was so much going on that sometimes when I was just feeling tired and down it was the result of the cumulative effect of like not having a proper night's sleep of you know my tongue falling apart like force feeding myself calories as well so looking at absolutely like calorie density we talk about trying to put 10,000 15,000 calories away a day but equally on top of that you were trying to make sure it was nutrient dense at the same time you know because void of any nutrients and your immune system is going to start wondering hitting that 1.7 grams per kg of body weight per day so uh, finding a nice time in the day to actually digest enough protein wow. you know and then on top of that even looking at like for everything when you talk about calorie density and nutrient density you also have to consider all of that's completely irrelevant if you're going through the Moray Firth and and you're swimming in these huge swells and tailwinds when you're trying to outswim your own sick because you're basically being sick and at the same time it's being brushed along. <laughs> oh, wow. So yeah, so then it's like, okay, calorie density, nutrient density, and you know what? Digestibility, you know, the third component. And then even if you do all of that, trying to look at also uh, palatability. So parts of my tongue were falling apart, as you um, know. I mean, so, so all of a sudden it's like, I love granola. I love fruit. Yeah, all that's brilliant. But what are you going to do when you've got no tongue left? Like, so I had to identify. Well, I mean, were there days where you thought, I'm, I'm, I'm not going in there. 
I just can't do it. I just want to stay here. I want to sleep. I, I just can't get in the water. Yeah, ab absolutely. And that was, for me, every single tide, that idea of central governor theory, you know, that we're more powerful than our own mind allows us to believe. My mind was playing all sorts of tricks on me, saying, stay in bed, have a rest day today, Ross. Ooh. So how did you motivate yourself? Was it you or was it someone, sometimes was it your team? Did some of them say, come on, Ross, you can do this, you've got this. I mean, what, 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 how did that go down, basically? Yeah, I think for one of the things that always worked for me was the fact that I said, I am not stepping foot on land until I have finished this and i i was absolutely like that is there's that's Stu not negotiable. naive enough to start yeah. stubborn enough to finish wrong absolutely <laughs> absolutely so then when you have made that like absolutely infallible law and you said there that's how this finishes it finishes with me being pulled out of the water against my own will or i walk onto margate beach successful then any question you ask yourself that when your mind starts playing tricks and goes, maybe you should have a rest day today. Maybe your tongue's falling apart. Maybe you should miss this tide. Uh, oh, may maybe it's a little bit ropey outside. We're swimming in 40 knots of wind. Is that safe? The answers always swim, always, because ultimately you're not going to get back to Margate otherwise. You know, so yeah. that that for me, it was like every question that was thrown up was completely irrelevant when you think about it in cold, hard logic. And I yeah. think that's sometimes the same, that again, when you wake up in the morning on a Sunday and you said, oh, I said I was gonna go on for a run today, but oh, oh, I think, oh, my, you know, my knees are feeling a little, oh yeah, knees are bad, oh, maybe I should rest there. I should have another rest day. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 no. Again, this idea of that I was fortunate enough to learn from the Royal Marines that they said, Ross, um, you know, when you are in a 30 mile yomp with like 50 kg on your backpack, um, you know, your cognitive clarity is, is that of a five-year-old. You know, so it goes back to that Maslow's hierarchy wow. of needs. Yeah, that you, you know, if today, for instance, we're having a very eloquent conversation right now. If I'd have asked you when you were hyperventilating in your suit and going, oh, Ron, can you explain to me uh, about my immune system? Or what? You'd have been like, no. <laughs> like, so it's this idea of, again, making peace with the fact that when you are sleep deprived, tired, had a hard week at work, and all of a sudden someone's saying to you, remember that session you said you were gonna do on Sunday? Know that it's fine that you are functioning with the cognitive clarity of a five-year-old. You know, yeah. and, and, and this was one thing that always stuck me with, with the Royal Marines. Um, as a sports scientist, uh, they said, Ross, you're a sports scientist. So you are used to performing at your best when you feel at your best. We're Royal Marines. We're used to performing at our best when we feel at our worst. And that always stuck with me because I think throughout life now, that right now, yeah, when you're hyperventilating, you know, all of a sudden I, go, I could go wrong. And you got the right footwear on. Have you got the right wetsuit? You know, it's like, well, no, I'm not performing at my best and I don't feel at my best. But be like a Royal Marine, perform at your best when you feel at your worst. You turned up, you know, with your goggles on, thinking you're going for a Sunday one. So it doesn't matter. You did it. You performed at your best when you were feeling at your worst. And you were probably equipped with your worst as well. I was. Well, given, given that I was getting my wetsuit out of its wrapper this morning and, and the goggles out of its case i was thinking uh, i was thinking Morgan, you probably should have worn this once to check it fit you probably should have put the goggles on the wall to check they're the right size of you and then on the bus i thought well too late now isn't it what am <laughs> i gonna do it is what we want to do just not do it because yeah i haven't prepared yeah and um, that's even looking at volume so i mean today was an event but even if that was today those same conversations would have gone over in your head if me and you were just turning up and training today yeah. and i think the reality is is looking at like volume you know and, ad and adherence it goes back to that that was it an optimal session today Day. Could you have gone faster? Could you have, you know, was running biomechanics on point? Could you have swum with better technique? Yeah. Probably. But, yes. But, but, yes. But, 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 you know, so was it optimal? No. But was it a great session? And what, have you improved as a result? Yes. Yeah, and I would I think, say progress, not perfection. Progress, yes, not perfection. Absolutely. Just get started. Yeah. And I think also uh, we cover this within the book, but, you know, I say so often we're trying to apply a, a simple mechanical solution to what's a complex biological reality. And again, I know that works within the medical profession, but, but equally you saw that today that I could talk to you all, you know, oh, you're six foot six and, and a half. You've got amazing limbs, like swimming biomechanics. All of a sudden, when, when I saw you out of that island and then the top, that rogue tide, yeah. Wow, well, hang on. We're not, we're not trying to apply a simple mechanical solution to what was a very complex biological reality. And I think it's it's exactly the same throughout life that, yeah, I could sit down and I could write people programs. I could write them the best diet plan in the world. All of that is completely useless if their taste buds disagree with it. All of a sudden yeah. they say, like, genetically, I'm actually just not very good. I, you know, me, I'm never going to be an Olympic rower. You know, so it's just this idea of, like, you know, working within your own, you know, yeah. physiology. You can apply a simple mechanical solution to a complex biological 
biological reality sometimes so often we can't yeah no incredible i mean man we could talk forever but i'm um, just to try and start to wrap this up a little bit um one thing that struck me today is you know we're sitting here in this wagon here and one of its three principles is about sustainability right so it's powered by solar panels it's made of wood it's got these beautiful plants in it do you think that one of the reasons why we're struggling with the environment as a society at the moment obviously there's a big push now to be more environmentally aware and everything we're doing do you think that comes from the fact that we've become disconnected from nature. Because I was thinking today as I was running, when I wasn't panicking, when I was actually in those moments and, and looking and thinking, is this really the UK? This feels like the Maldives or something. It's just absolutely incredible mm. looking out. I thought if people experience this regularly, would that not automatically mean that they want to look after nature more, look after the world a little bit more? I mean, have you felt that before? Yeah, I. it's weird. I Today, I said, the only way I can describe today is like um, ethical athletics. And what I mean by that is just this idea of, uh, it was quite sad, there was those haunting images of the London Marathon this year. And afterwards, you saw plastic bottles and energels and everything all around the streets. And it was like we were trying to shoehorn an event, you know, into an environment and it didn't work. Whereas what we've seen you know certainly this weekend is instead we've said this is the environment let's create an event around it yeah. we've not changed the course no. we've just swum around headlands we've let the coastline dictate the course and i think you're absolutely right that for me this idea of ethical athletics it also again to, to sum up as, as a central theme to this talk it's you know that's your okugaki that is what the yamabushi monks is a mounted religion that they believe that this idea of self-discipline uh, self-discovery through self discipline comes from the mountains and I think it's exactly the same here that what we've done today is an okugaki and I think more and more people can get back to that so when you are intrinsically motivated to find an event I love what you've added there try and make sure as a third that it's within an environment that resonates within you that it's like I can't explain it but Devon is like this spiritual home then cool go there but yeah. other people friends of mine are like they, they've never felt more alive when they are hurtling you know 20 miles per hour down a cliff face and they're fell running and they just love the fells and they're like oh feel the wind in your hair and I'm like oh god I'm cold <laughs> you know yeah. so it's this but for them they get it and again it's an intangible it's I hope people, yeah, empower sure. themselves to ask. It reminds me, of, I spoke to Killian Journey just a few weeks ago on the oh, podcast, wow. and uh, it was just amazing to just hear his story. And for him, he, he just seems one of the most humble guys I've ever met. He just, he just does it. It's, it's, it's his, it's his pilgrimage. You know, it's yes. his thing. He's not doing it for anyone else. He's no. doing it because it, it makes him feel alive. He learns about himself while he's doing Killian's it. Killian's an amazing example, actually. He is he is a running Yamabushi, whether he realizes, you know, he's that Yamabushi yeah. monk. If you ask him and you say, you're going to do all this, but there's going to be no medals, he'll go, that's not why I'm doing it. He's not why I'm doing it. And, I, and really, that's what struck me. He had this single minded dedication to living the life that he wants to live. Mm. And I thought, Wow, we can all learn from that. Mm. Ross, look, we're going to have to wrap this up. Um, you're writing a new book. Quick summary. What's it about? I am, yeah. So we've got uh, The Art of Resilience. I think the, the world's fittest book was amazing. Um, I, I called it that. I probably should point out that, you know, that is not me saying it, I'm the world's fittest man. Anything. It was more a testament to you know, th this melting pot of geniuses. So, you know, Linford Christie helped me write the speed chapter. Jeff Capes, two-time world's strongest oh, man. Wow. Andy Bolton, first guy to deadlift a thousand pounds. You know, all of these guys, the Cambridge rowing team. So it was, it, I called it the world's fittest book because I believe, you know, some of the world's fittest people who I was just fortunate enough to learn from yeah. helped me write it. Um, that deals a lot with the physicality of, of training, how you could basically like a, a an almost like operating system for the body to say okay hang on right how are we going to get from a to b how are we going to become faster stronger leaner quicker um but i think the new book the art of resilience uh, has really come around because a lot of people wanted me to talk about the uh, the mental aspect mental fortitude you know resilience the intangibles that we've covered you know on this podcast really that i really now want to make sense of so i am this has been nice this has been like therapy but for, for been, me as well <laughs> So I've deconstructed and reverse engineered the Great British Swim. I've locked myself in a room for what's been months now. And I tried right to make... Yeah. I know that feeling. 
to just <laughs> you're right to try and fuse whatever. How how did I do it? And it's looking at uh, theories in sports science and fusing it with philosophies of Stoic ancient philosophy. Oh, wow, I can't wait. So read it. When's it? When's it due uh, out? Uh, May. Yeah, May, so May, May next year. May 2020. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, maybe, maybe depending on how this one goes, if you're interested, we could maybe have another 100%. conversation about that 100%. and uh, put it out when, when the new book is out. But, oh. Ross, look, I can't thank you enough for making some time to talk to me today. I think you're an incredibly inspirational guy. I think there are so many take-homes to people from this podcast. It's called Feel Better, Live More. I believe that when people feel better in themselves, they get more out of their lives. We've covered a lot of take-home tips today, but I wonder if you could just summarize at the end three or four of your top tips for the listeners to inspire them to believe that they can be the architects of their own health. Yeah, I love that. I think, I've loved how this is centered around, I hope that people can take away to find their own okugaki that they will be intrinsically motivated to pursue. And like I said, I would love it if in a few weeks, months, a year, it doesn't matter if people messages on social media and say, do you know what guys, I did it, intrinsically motivated, and it just for cathartic reasons, for this idea of sporting spirituality that people will go, I did it, I ran, swam, cycled, rode, doesn't matter what it is, but do that for your own okugaki, your own sort of self-discipline um, for self-discovery. That 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 will be amazing. Wow, inspiring way to finish the podcast, <laughs> Ross. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bless you. Thank you so much, mate.